Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I like, would like to welcome you to our free webinar, an alternative to titanium implants, Zeromax uh, organic, Zeromax uh, ceramic uh, implants organized by Nafi Academy. Tonight, we have the privilege of having our esteemed speaker, Dr. Kuma, to share his wisdom and insights on the topic. Dr. Kuma is the CEO and founder of Nafi Dental Group with 10 clinics uh, island-wide in Singapore. He's uh, both the director of Zaga Center Singapore and uh, Malo Dental Singapore. And without further ado, Dr. Kuma, please. Thank you, Ken. Um, allow me to put up my slides. I'd like to uh, wish everyone a, a warm, uh, cozy evening in your homes. We took the time at eight o'clock to be uh, a bit more uh, convenient, I suppose, for for those of us who either have had celebrations today, this Indian New Year going on, and for those of us who are preparing for the long weekend ahead of us. Um, thank you for joining in. I'm looking forward to sharing with you um, some of my um, experience with the uh, Zeramex uh, ceramic implants. Uh, as you know, titanium and um, zirconia are both uh, materials which can also integrate with the bone. And today I shall share with you some cases and some very interesting findings as well. So one of the reasons why I started using ceramic implants was because way back in 20, 2017, there was a patient that came to my clinic in Bedok. And the patient was actually a rheumatologist from uh, Malaysia. And she was actually hunting for someone to remove a failed ceramic implant in her. And it was at that point that I was querying as to why she needed a ceramic implant in the first place. And after speaking to her at length, my interest was piqued. And of course, thereafter, I searched for courses to go on to learn how to place ceramic implants. Of course, there was lots of uh, positive and dreadfully negative data at that point of time. But I decided to further my knowledge to to find new clinical outcomes for the patients that would come my way uh, in years thereafter. So let me talk to you about zirconia as a dental implant material and also some of the research findings that we have uh, in the literature. There are known advantages and uh, sadly some limitations of zirconia dental implants from yesteryear, but I would like to convince you otherwise today that uh, zirconia den dental implants are really truly uh, well engineered and uh, planned for use for the years ahead of us. I will present some clinical cases. And of course, I will talk to you about the Zeramex XT implant system, which is already available in Singapore for purchase by clinicians uh, by a company called Medident International, which is a company which I have uh, shareholdings of, I would like to add. Uh, but at this point, you must understand why that happened. There was no um, ceramic implant importer in Singapore. And because I was quite focused and um, I wanted to bring uh, a zirconia implant material in for my patients, I decided to take up the ownership of the Zeramex XT implant system, the distributorship in Singapore. And now we have, uh, as of last December, um, HSA clearance to sell it to the rest of Singapore. We all know this. We have seen plenty of uh, implants shimmering through uh, thin gingival biotypes. Metal implants, that is titanium, can be unsightly, gray. And sometimes they don't look like actual teeth because of that grayness. With zirconia, because it's white, it doesn't have that problem. Well, let's look at the biological problem ahead of us. Up to one third of our patients who have dental implants end up having uh, peri-implantitis. And that's because titanium being a metal will attract and collect far much more dental plaque than zirconia, uh, the zirconia material itself. And because the plaque adhesion is higher, that's why you get uh, peri-implantitis. There's more research about clean surfaces, of course. And for those of you who have been following the literature, um, there's a very large company uh, that's actually looking at the surfaces of uh, dental implants, both titanium and, and cer ceramic. And what they're looking for is to ensure that there are less uh, contaminants on the implant surfaces. It doesn't mean that a ceramic implant has no contaminants, 
but there are far much more in, a, in, in general contaminants on a metal surface than that of a ceramic uh, surface. Okay, with periimplantitis, you'll get an acidic environment around your implant and your implant eventually will be doomed to failure. Now, the benefit of having a ceramic implant is that the gingiva will also form a very nice cuff of long junctional epithelium, allowing a small cuff of tissue preventing ingress of bacteria ap apically to destroy um, the, the interface between the bone and the implant. Now, of course, many of you um, especially the senior surgeons or the senior dentists over here may have heard that uh, zircon implants are notorious for breakage. Well, titanium implants can also break. And in fact, if implant placement is done incorrectly or without planning for occlusal support uh, or occlusal derangement, uh, you will have patients who end up fracturing both zircon and titanium implants. But because of the types of implants that were available before for ceramic, uh, yes, there have been fractures before, and many of the reasons are because they use very unfavorable narrow diameter implants, but I'm glad to tell you that this has been overcome, and of course, at that point of time, they were super eager to increase the attachment between bone and the zircona surface, so they sandblasted the implants with the uh, uh, aggressive alumina sandblasting, and that has obviously led to um, the implant surface becoming more brittle, and thereafter, it would fracture. In some cases of patients where um, the patients would have immediate implants and then your PCT would get uh, implant failure because either there was uh, too early loading or perhaps the patient would have had an immediate implant, an immediate crown, and the patient was actually just biting far too early and putting um, too much of load in the first eight weeks of uh, the implant um, uh, healing to the bone we all know that zirconia implants would obviously be more expensive than titanium implants. And once again, we can't definitively say that there's far much more health benefits of a zirconia implant compared to titanium. But however, because of the sheer reason that there are far many more titanium uh, implant companies, obviously zirconia implant companies, which are fewer in number, would obviously be far much more expensive. But the good news for you is that uh, in terms of both titanium and uh, zirconia, the survivability rates are about the same at a 12 year mark and more recently 15 to 20 years. If you look at the Titanic, this is at the right at the bottom of the sea, look at what has happened to the metal. Metal undergoes severe corrosion with time. I see that there are some questions. Uh, if there are some questions, please feel free to add them in the Q&A and I'll answer them at the end, okay? Now, if you look at ceramic, here you see a ceramic uh, jar, jug and this has been around for 2000 odd years okay and you can see there's little change over a period of time and you can see how much of damage uh corrosion can cause uh because of water and especially halides in the mouth including chloride ions any form of halide ions that you'll find uh in in the mouth due to saliva uh, will cause breakage and uh, destruction of the uh in, the implant surface and in the case of uh, titanium, we do not know where these ions are going to. Further, uh, we also have uh, patients who would come back after a titanium implant placement and say, hey, I, I feel strange. There is this strange pain. I can't describe it more than uncomfortable sensation. I feel that there's something there. Uh, I feel that I'm a bit numb in that area. And you go and check, there is no mobility. And you see that there's no radiolucency on the X-ray. There's no pus. And you, in fact, you even see that there's no resorption, but the pain still is there. And you want to know what is happening. And in those instances, some of us in the, in the audience would have seen some patients come to our clinics. And some of us who would have taken out those implants, put back another implant, sometimes the pain goes away and sometimes the pain comes back and the patient finds yet another dentist. So why? Perhaps zirconia is a material which is uh, far much more biocompatible than titanium. Well, that's for me to discuss today, and I will talk to you about some of the findings that we have. Now, the next three slides will look at um, systematic reviews. It's far much easier for us to look at systematic reviews because someone has done the hard work of analyzing lots of clinical data across several papers. In the first paper that I'm sharing, there's a 2008, the study by Wenz et al. 
the conclusion is that zirconia implants could be an alternative to titanium implants, but were not recommended at that point for routine clinical use as no long-term clinical data uh, was available. Now, if we look at um, what has happened to amalgam, uh, the so-called so mercury fillings and composites. Now, composites have been around for a relatively small amount of time compared to uh, amalgam. But as you know, more recently, in 2018, the uh, in EU, yeah, the European Union banned amalgam to be placed in anyone under the age of 15, and also uh, women who were breastfeeding or who were pregnant. So there's something to be said about um, you know, materials and what we know about them and what more findings we get as we understand uh, products and also the, the, relevant def, um, the relevant effect on the human body in terms of damage to organs uh, for it to affect the liver the kidney. And sometimes these products, the byproducts or corrosion products can make their way to the brain and across the blood brain barrier or even um, get to the, um, a fetus in a pregnant woman. So the reason why I mention is this because just because a study in 2008 says that there's not sufficient long-term clinical data doesn't mean that we shouldn't look at it and ask ourselves and convince ourselves that, hey, this is something that is growing, it will take time, but it's something that potentially could be an alternative to titanium for a non-metallic implant solution. Then we move on to 2017, and we're looking at the survival rate and marginal bone loss of a zirconia dental implants, and we find it similar to that of two-piece titanium implants. In 2018, we've seen that there's no significant difference between zirconia or titanium on the results form based on looking at bone to implant contact. And in 2020, Borges et al. shows that zirconia presents results similar to that of titanium. Um, there was overall failure of 6.8% in 2.75 years in, in those in this 19 articles he's talking about. But it also shows that over a short follow-up period of time, perhaps this data is not completely believable by us and that more longest long-term studies need to be done. We move on to other studies that tell us that there's no difference between the rate of osseointegration in animal studies between that of titanium and zirconia. Uh, further, um, when the first zirconia implants were made, they were severely uh, blasted with the alumina. And this led to lots of uh, brittle surfaces. Then what happened was that zirconia implants were started to be acid etched instead. And this was, was found to reduce the brittleness of the surface of zirconia. And this actually improved the uh, osseointegration. More about this when we talk about and look at a Zeramax XT implant. Um, there have obviously been uh, uh, people trying to use this in all on four situations, so the edentulous, mandible, and the maxilla. And, and the studies actually show us that zirconia has the same sort of bone implant contact, similar to that of titanium in those studies. And of course, um, Siva Raman in 2018, which is a critical review looking at multiple papers, looked at the potential of two-piece zirconia implant, but criticized a one-piece zirconia implant, especially in the posterior region, because it's a problem in terms of a restorative uh, conundrum, where a one-piece implant seemed to be an ideal implant to be placed because of the lack of uh, a zone there where bacteria would form. But the problem, of course, remains that you can't restore this easily because you get lots of food trap uh, at the sides of the implant crown. Now we move over to 2019, where the studies done by Rowling et al. They looked at 37 preclinical studies looking at uh, both the materials in both with regards to soft and hard tissue. And they clearly show that both titanium and zirconia have similar soft and hard tissue integration capacity. Although it says that titanium uh, shows a faster initial osseointegration process. We all know it doesn't really matter how long it takes for osseointegration. What's more important is that it also integrates by the time we restore it with a crown. Okay, and we look at further studies. Further studies, of course, tell us that, you know, zirconia implants may show higher crustal bone loss compared to titanium. The problem with that study that uh, Araregi presented is that they had a very, very high heterogeneous uh, result. So that means that you can't actually trust the results that have been um, in, presented in these six studies. Further, 
we look at um, Comiso, who then presented uh, a systematic review of 15 articles. And obviously, this is the easiest thing for us to all believe that zirconia implants, one, have much better aesthetic outcomes than titanium implants, less plaque in accumulation, and less inflammation around the peri-implant mucosa compared to that of titanium. But I already mentioned as to why that's the case. Now, let's look at the advantages and limitations of zirconia. We already know that zirconia is going to be a far much more aesthetic dental implant versus titanium. We have already looked at zirconia posts in root canal treated teeth. We know we wanted to move towards zirconia rather than metal because it is far much more aesthetic and was transilluminable. And we also know that zirconia posts in root canal treated teeth are more expensive. So it's no surprise that zirconia dental implants will also follow suit. But the, mind, the most important thing here is that it is a non-metal implant and where a patient desires an implant and is, has a known metal allergy, this is probably the best chance they have if they want to fix restoration in their mouth. Now, although we know that there are many uh, studies, the studies obviously are not as long-term compared to the ones that we have with titanium. But as I said to you before, just because, just because we haven't had enough time to assess the product properly, it doesn't mean that we give up on this product. Most of the patients that I have, it's amazing to see a zirconia implant crown, which obviously collects much less plaque than a, a post infused to metal crown. But more interesting is interestingly around a zirconia dental implant, I see two things. I notice that there is the process of gingival creep, allowing the gingiva to creep up the surface of both the implant. And obviously, if you have um, a zirconia crown as well, there's much less plug accumulation around a zirconia implant and an implant a zirconia crown compared to that of a titanium. Now, I had a patient that came to me from Brunei, and this particular patient has had, she, he had traveled uh, both to Australia and Malaysia. That's part of his work. So he traveled those places for that reason. He ended up in Singapore and He's obviously his uh, crown had fractured and that's the reason why he came to see me. So when he saw me, he said, look, two dentists have really tried to put crowns on this uh, implant of mine. It's a ceramic implant. I placed it many years ago. Before he opened his mouth, I already knew that he, it was gonna be a small diameter zirconia implant. And that's the problem I had. So I then made a crown for him, which obviously had a huge food trap, as you can imagine, both on mesial and distal areas. I cemented it in with the, uh, with Rely X, and three years later, he came back and the same crown had fractured. Um, of course, he was a Bruxer. Of course, for patients who have all these problems are all Bruxers, of course, as we obviously uh, endure. And that's because uh, these patients are usually in high stress jobs. And what I had to do in the end for him was I had to remove that one piece implant and place a two piece implant. We all know one piece implants have uh, prosthodontic challenges, okay? And the instance of a zirconia implants, we do not have a multi-unit apartment for all on, files, all on four style tilted implants. But the benefits of this, I'll tell you now, I don't see as much peri-implantitis in my patients who have had zirconia implants compared to patients who have had titanium implants. Now, whether they have a reduced systemic absorption or effect, it's completely up to you whether you wish to believe or not. But I've seen plenty of patients coming through who have eczema, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, patients who have uh, systemic uh, chronic granulomatous conditions, sarcoidosis, searching for someone, and they do not want to upset their immune system for this. There are many, many patients around the world that head towards Switzerland, very famed for having lots of uh, uh, ceramic implant systems, as I'm told, holistic treatment, where dentists treat the patients who will then disinfect the extraction sites with ozone, and put platelet-rich fibrin, where well, we have all of this now in Southeast Asia. Let's look at the first case. This case is a case very, very close to me. Let me tell you a bit about him. Uh, it's a 43-year-old male who called me one evening and said that my tooth is moving on the bottom left-hand side. So I then saw him quite quickly. <clears throat> I had to see him quite quickly, you see, because he was my brother. Now, my brother has a history of uh, grass, pollen, allergies, dust mite allergies. He had uh, eczema as a child and childhood asthma. 
Now, one year after I placed the titanium implant in him, and mind you, this implant was done as an immediate implant, of course. Tooth came out, implant went in. Four months later, we restored the, the implant. One year after this, the implant became loose. And at that point of time, when I first uh, had placed the implant, I did not have a ceramic implant as an option for him. But of course, come a few years later, uh, after the involvement with uh, that first patient I saw from, from Malaysia, I had already told, told myself that perhaps if I had an opportunity to place a ceramic implant in a patient who would fit the criteria of someone who has allergies, I would do so. And then my brother says, um, my implant is shaky. I think there's a problem. So as we would all do, we take an X-ray and we would assume that it's the uh, abutment screw that is a bit loose. So we, we access the screw channel and we try and tighten. But lo and behold, the implant had failed. So I took out the implant and then waited for a month before going back in again. And this is the tissue response around uh, the implant, as you can see. So that is a Zeramax P6 implant. That is the uh, slightly older generation implant that Zeramax had. Uh, it's a very, very good implant system. Um, but I now have a new system, uh, which I'll show you, talk to you about. It's, this is the P6 system. And the new system is the XT system. And you can see here, if you look at the keratinization of the Jason mucosa around the implant, you can see and you will agree with me that the tissue response is impeccable. Let's look at case number two. This is a 46-year-old Chinese lady who came in, unrestorable upper left one. I took out the tooth, uh, placed an implant immediately, and I also loaded it at the same time. You can see the clinical results over here. You can even see exactly where I've made the incision mark, incision, uh, incisions to, uh, to raise my mucoparousal flap. Now you can see over here, the gingival cuff around the, the crown of the implant is fantastic. And in terms of the, the effect it has, if I had a titanium implant over here, I might see a gray hue over there. Some of you may argue and say, but hang on, you would have added some bone graft, didn't you? I did not add bone graft in this, this case. And um, the, the reason for that is she had a much thicker buccal uh, bone labial plate. There was no need to. I don't routinely do this for patients who have um, uh, anterior implants placed in my practice. But in this particular case, I want to tell you that because it is a white implant surface, the, the tissue aesthetics is far much more superior than that of a titanium one. This is the tissue response you can see. Now for the third case, um, I'm just going to show you a sprinkling of cases, okay? Some of these cases are not complete, of course, but there are good reasons as to why I show you, because I want to show you the variety and the flavor of what sort of implant uh, indications you can have. Now, this patient is a 52-year-old 50 Caucasian patient. He came with a cracked lower right seven. I proceeded to remove the tooth and placed a Zeramax white-based implant, okay, immediately, right? So I took the tooth out and placed an implant. And that's the restoration. One of some of you may argue and say that, hey, there's initial bone loss over here. But if you look actually carefully, that's the top of the implant and this part over here. So we'll tell, we'll, I'll talk to you about the Zeramax implant surface in, in a short while. And the neck and the actual body of the implants are actually different in terms of the polish. It's, it's a polished surface for the, uh, the neck. And what you see over here is, uh, there is no gap between the crown and the implant, okay? You can see in certain implant system, there will be a gap, there'll be a slight gap. The Zeramax system doesn't allow for this. It wants a very, very um, tight adaptation of both the um, tie base, or not tie base equivalent of the titanium base is, is not present in a, um, a Zeramax system, but it has a ceramic abutment, which obviously is uh, talked into the ceramic, the ceramic, uh, implant fixture itself. And there's usually no gap when you look at this on an x-ray. Now let's look at uh, case four. This patient is a 50-year-old female with an atrophic ridge at the upper right six area. And this is about three millimeters in uh, height. So I'd have to perform uh, a lateral window sinus lift, of course. And so I placed a, a white body. So the Zeramex implant system has both a narrow, a regular, and a white body. Okay, the white body is fantastic for molars because the emergent profile is, is beautiful. It's much larger. As you can see over here, the window has been accessed. 
I've used osteon uh, bone particles to be put inside. Now for all my sinus lips, I always routinely take platelet rich fibrin. I harvest uh, 18, 20 mils of uh, blood from the patient's cubital fossa and I'll mix this with the uh, bone and then I'll get a very, very nice sticky bone mass and that goes into the sinus. And I put on top of that something which you see over here, it's called osteomesh. I've already mentioned this in some talks before. Some of you who have been following my talks will know that osteomesh is a fantastic material. It's uh, made of polycaprolactone and it's a very, very good material because not only does it convert to bone, it also sticks to the tissue surface and thickens the area uh, in preparation for good attached gingiva. And here you can see the sutures that have been placed around the implant. And that's actually a cover screw, not uh, a healing abutment for uh, this particular Xerox implant. And here you see the implant that has been placed simultaneously with the sinus lift at the same time. This is case number five. Uh, this is a 34 year old female Malaysian stuck in Singapore, unfortunately couldn't go back to Malaysia to finish up her orthodontic treatment and had also missing upper first premolars. So when I saw her, I said, hey, you have a lot of spacing. And she said, look, just remove all these um, brackets off me. So I did that for her. And then she said, can you do anything for me? I said, I can do plenty for you. So after the debonding, I just prepped her for Invisalign. And then we started after one round of gingival, um, sub, sub gingival debridement, we decided to proceed with uh, Invisalign. So we did Invisalign, aligned the teeth and then placed two implants. Of course, these are ceramic implants. So the implants were placed nine months post Invisalign. And that's her at the moment. You can see that these are the two crowns. The implants are restored four months later. And why am I showing, this, showing you this case? It's a very simple, straightforward case, I suppose. But the illustration here is that you've seen a case of immediate implant placement. You've seen a case of uh, an implant that's been placed at the same time as uh, uh, lateral window sinus lift. And you've seen a case of uh, where I've used um, Xeramex implants, ceramic implant, in what you would imagine to be a very atrophic site because this patient has had, um, not had a, a premolar there for a long, long time. Um, this last case is also quite interesting, and we'll spend a bit of time talking about this case. This is a 33-year-old female. She came in complaining of pain past the usual mobility of a lower left six with a previous history of uh, root canal treatment and obviously has chronic apical perio. She came to me, and she came to me, and I took the x-ray, and it looked like that. Okay, So the previous one was the x-ray that she brought in to, to show me the history of this tooth. Uh, by the time she had seen me, it had already been one month since... Um, uh, the extraction. Now, of course, the discerning amongst you would obviously say that, hey, hang on, you didn't have a chance to curate that site. Are you planning to place an implant straight away? I routinely curate my ex the, the extraction sites, whether it was done by me or done by someone else. But this ended up being a delayed implant placement, and I restored the implant crown for her. Now, one year later, of course, she comes back to me and says, there's a problem, the implant is loose. I said, how can the implant be loose? So I take an X-ray and I see a lot of bone loss. And then I look in the mouth and I see the tooth moving around. So I remove the implant and then I place a ceramic implant. Now, what I haven't mentioned to you is that by the time she had that uh, titanium implant removed to the point where she had the ceramic implant, that was about a month. I always give these patients about a month rest to allow the bone to heal and for any infection to surface. When she turned up on the day of surgery, we were planning to put a titanium implant back in. And then all of a sudden she tells me, in fact, I noticed that she wasn't wearing a watch. She wasn't wearing any um, chains. I said, why aren't you wearing uh, any form of uh, jewelry on you? Oh, I have a very bad allergy to certain metals. I said, oh, really, tell me. Oh, for example, I had a titanium stud on my belly button and that got really badly infected. It took like six months for the infection to clear. So I went like, and you only decided to tell me this now. So based on that, I said, immediately just this surgery was just about to happen. We opened up a, uh, a dentium kit for her to have a titanium implant placed. And then I said, you know, I think it'd be just easier for all of us, just for my, my own sanity as well, if we placed uh, a ceramic implant instead. And once she heard that there was such an option, she said, just go ahead. 
And this was only done this, this last week. And only time will tell whether we're going to be successful. But somewhat, what is important to know over here is that some patients will not tell you these things until you probe and ask. And only when you ask, for some reason, does the patient think that there's actually something that a dentist needs to know. Let's look at the ceramic implant that we have in Singapore today. Um, I believe Strauman also has a ceramic implant uh, that they were either about to bring to Singapore or already has been in Singapore. The Xeramex XT implant system, for all of you who are here today, you should know that Nobel Biocare has a contract with Dental Point AG who manufactures Xeramex implants. So the Nobel Pearl, which is the Nobel Biocare ceramic implant, is actually manufactured by the same company that manufactures the Xeramex implant. In fact, they are exactly the same. So the Xeramex uh, implant, if it comes in a pink box, it's a Xeramex implant. If it comes in a white box, it's called a Nobel Pearl implant. Okay, so this is a new generation of ceramic implants. The material that is used is uh, different from before. It's been treated and uh, ensured that the zirconia that's used now is far much more resistant to fracture and can be made to, to have two parts, which means you can have platform switching, you can have a much larger base, and you can have lots of interesting uh, threads, grooves that the older zirconia implant systems were unable to have. Now, of course, you want to make sure that um, whatever you use is not metal. And of course, many of you might be wondering, aren't you going to be using a metal screw inside to retain the abutment to the implant fixture? No, it's a carbon screw, right? So it's a carbon screw, it's called a bicarbo screw. And that's a trademark of the screw that they use. It has, uh, it acts like a bolt, okay? So what happens is that there are four interlocks of the abutment into the implant fixture itself. So there are four interlocks, it goes in and then you get a screw that goes inside, which is made out of um, carbon. Now, interesting, this particular screw, when you put it in, it's meant to be put in once and talk to the maximum, and thereafter, it's not meant to be removed anymore. So I have yet to have screw loosening in a titanium, in a Xeramax patient, because just because of the screw. In fact, if you want to remove uh, the carbon screw, it's a challenge you would have to cut a groove in it and unscrew it anti-clockwise. So uh, for those of you who had problems with patients who brags, patients who've had got lots of eccentric movements, parafunctional habits, and you've had lots of screw loosening, here's an implant system where the screw actually molds to the surface, uh, sorry, to the, uh, uh, this is the surface of the, uh, where the threads are for the, the implant abutment screw, and it prevents loosening. So I'm excited to tell you that um, if you have such patients who have lots of um, regular loosening, and if you have any desire to replace an old implant system for the patient, you may wish to consider a Xeramax implant system because it is true, I don't have screw loosening in, these, in, this, patient, in this patient group. Now I mentioned to you before that three types of uh, sizes that the Xeramax implants come in. It's SB, which is the smallest size. And then you have, uh, RB, which is the regular base, and then there's WB, which is the uh, white base, okay? The surface of the implant is known as a xerophil, that's their own trademark, of course, and it's a microstructure implant surface, and um, it's been acid etched. As I said to you before, in the past, they used to blast these things with aluminum oxide, making the surface very brittle. Now they just etch the surface, and you'll be very happy to note that uh, Xeramex is committed to the clean implant foundation, and they also want to ensure that the products are always consistently free of any form of surface impurities as well. Um, as I mentioned to you before, Xeramax implants enjoy the flexibility of having platform switching. Now, for those of you who know what platform switching does for implants, it's um, fantastic because it allows, one, it reduces potential crestal bone loss. Number two, it allows more soft tissue ingress to allow thicker volume around the implant platform. And of course, you have to note that it's not every single, so an SB, for example, could be used on, uh, you, can't, you can't use a white base abutment on an SB, which means you can't use the white base abutment on the smallest implant, uh, Xeramex implant system, but the rest of the swaps you can. You can put a, 
a smaller abutment on a white base or a smaller abutment on a regular platform. Okay, so that's good to know. And just a small note again, uh, with regards to the bicarbo screw, the bicarbo screw is used, you can talk it at 15 Newtons if you want to try, do a try-in of your uh, implant crown or implant bridge. But thereafter, once you talk it at uh, 25 or 30, that's it. It's very difficult to remove. It's forms, it, it's intentionally, it will intentionally deform and prevent you from removing it easily. You would literally have to cut a groove and remove it using a flat implant driver. All right, so if we've come to the end of the, the presentation. I'd like to thank uh, um, Ken for setting up this talk for me. Uh, just a small sort of mini advert for those of you who know about the Oracil, a mouthwash that was launched by Medident. Oracil orange is uh, povidonidine at 1%. Uh, this has been recently sent to all households by uh, Tamasic Foundation. And Oracil green is uh, chlorhexidine mouthwash, which we have at Medident. For some of you who might be interested in doing uh, uh, platelet-rich fibrin in dentistry, uh, the current use in Singapore for platelet-rich fibrin is in conjunction with uh, particulate bone. I like to use synthetic bone. So I always tell my patients that I make it biological by using platelet-rich fibrin. And this particular course is aimed at both educating your nurses as to what sort of setup you would need and the dentist to actually uh, practice uh, venue puncture on themselves. And of course, to find out what uh, centrifuging protocols we use uh, to make uh, the platelet rich fibrin actually work with the particulate bone. I know lots of people who go on courses and come back and tell me that they can't get sticky bone. Um, but we'll show you how, of course. And the next course, which will be on 28th and 29th of May, it's a two-day clinical residency program for those of you interested in all on for dental implants. Um, this particular implant program will not be using a ceramic implants, of course, as I've told you before, multi-unit abutments are not available at current time for ceramic implants. And for those of you who want to know, it's about 16 CPE if you want to add, uh, collect CPE points for the next two years. Now, I'd like to thank all of you for um, uh, coming and um, listening to this webinar, of course. Now, if you want to contact anyone with regards to buying Zermax implants, please kindly contact Sneha. That's a number at the bottom, and that's an email address. For those uh, participants who have uh, signed up today, I believe there's some special uh, rates they're looking for, that they arranged for you. Please contact so that you will be able to get these rates. In terms of a clinical sort of um, mentoring, for those of you interested, and once again, as I said, there is um, some difference in terms of how we place a titanium implant and a ceramic, ceramic, uh, ceramic implant. Uh, and that's just owing to the protocol that the company has to ensure success. Um, you can obviously ask me and I will be around to show you and take you through um, some situations and uh, perhaps even a familiarization of the kit and the prosthetic elements as well. Um, once again, the person you should contact is Sneha. Her number is down there and her email address is down there as well. Thank you. Right, so Ken, let's look at some questions. Uh, Dr. Kumar, there's actually a question uh, from one of the attendees. Yeah. Uh, have you had any patients responding negatively to zirconia implants? Yes, I have had one patient who responded negatively to... Um, so this is life. When you have a failure in any sort of prosthodontic or surgical aspect, you need to ask yourself as to why this has happened. So I had a patient, of course, I, had, I placed a titanium implant and then I decided to place a zirconia implant because the titanium implant had failed and the zirconia implant failed. Now, many of us would just give up, right? But I didn't decide to give up, of course. And at that point of time, I just come back from an um, implant conference where they were talking about vitamin D and how valuable it was in terms of uh, bone healing. I then told the patient to do a vitamin D test. And lo and behold, vitamin D levels were far much, much lower than normal. So I got the patient to have vitamin D. The patient came back. I redid the implant, of course, and then it was successful. So just sharing this purely because if I had not gone for that conference, I would not have thought about uh, wondering about the vitamin D levels of the patient. Yes, that implant had failed. So <clears throat> a zirconia implant will not do a magic show in someone who's got uh, decreased vitamin D levels. Next question, Ken. 
Uh, there's actually a gen, gen, I think a gentleman or lady, uh, Tio Gyok Ming has uh, raised uh, uh, his or her hand. Yes. Uh, you you want to ask the question? Uh, oh, I think it's a it's a mistake. Okay, any other further questions? Okay, so Sorinda has actually asked a question of whether mm. peak is BPA free. I actually do not know the answer for the question. BPA, as we know, is bisphenol uh, A, and there are lots of uh, patients these days who actually ask us whether the composite fillings they're actually getting are BPA free. Uh, I do not know whether this particular product is BPA free. I will ask um, uh, Dental Point and find out for you. Thank you. Any further questions? Right. If there are no further questions, I'm just going to say a few more things before we end uh, this evening's talk. I'd like to thank everyone to who actually has made this effort to come down because you have one have been curious to find out why I have been placing ceramic implants, the existence of ceramic implants, and two, why there's been such negative press about ceramic implants. But more importantly, the very fact that you are here shows that you want to know what advances that have been in the realm of ceramic dentistry. Zirconia, as you know, it's a very difficult material to handle even in the laboratory. We've got tons of problems with zirconia in terms of the color matches. Very frequently, we're so used to having a great shade matches with PFMs and Emacs. And then here you have zirconia, which comes in blanks, ugly, uh, very high value opaque blanks. And to make them translucent and to give character to anterior teeth is very difficult. Manipulation of zirconia has been characteristically difficult for many, many years, okay? And it's only now that we've been able to get a two-piece implant. The P6 implant was the first two-piece implant that uh, Zeramax came up with. And the XT implant is a very different sort of implant because the XT, sorry, the uh, P6 implant was an external hex implant. And the XT implant now that Zeramax now uses, the P6 implant is still available, but not available in Singapore. The P6 implant is external hex. The XT implant is internal hex. For those of you who use internal hex, you'll find that internal hex is very much easier to restore, much easier for you to place. And uh, of course, lots of things which some of the senior surgeons will tell you external hex implants are good for, it also has because of the design of the implant itself in terms of the neck and the design of the uh, implant threads. Um, I would also have to say at this point that because there's a flexibility of uh, Zeramax to have a uh, different sort of platform switching, it allows us to actually really take advantage of, we want to see lots of fat molar emergent profiles because this really reduces the amount of uh, food getting stuck around an implant crown. And as we know, as much as we want our patients to floss and use uh, water picks, they don't, okay? So this has all been now um, rectified with the designs that we have. Um, I know some of us over here like white base implants and I very, very commonly use the white, the white base implant for um, even premolars at times and definitely molars. Uh, for the anterior region, I tend to use the, the regular base and for lateral incisors, I obviously use the, the smallest platform. They have the SB. Um, in terms of what I prefer for anterior implants, I usually load my anterior implants, uh, Zeramax um, ceramic implants, and I load them. Sometimes I use socket shield. Some of you are familiar with this. You have a tooth, you just remove most of the tooth and lift a very thin sliver of uh, uh, tooth material. So that's attached to that remaining uh, buckle bone. And I place the Zeramax implant uh, posterior to this. In those instances, I would not use a bone graft. Uh, I would then sometimes raise the flap to ensure that there's no periapical pathology that's not eliminated. And I would still place a temporary restoration that is loaded on the same day. My frequent um, 
um, my, my, my most favorite and frequent biological dental procedure I do is to harvest blood for the purposes of platelet-rich fibrin. Lovely procedure, something which you should all try and do and at least understand why and how different it handles. You can make lots of uh, lovely membranes using platelet-rich fibrin, but the fantastic thing is that if you've had patients who have had, you've had lots of particulate bone coming out from the, uh, the bone graft augment site, if you use a sticky bone, and it's truly sticky when I say, when I say sticky, I mean like you can pull the whole thing and it moves like this, yes? If you can do sticky bone of that consistency and use either a membrane or a PRF membrane as well, you get one, fantastic tissue healing, and two, you get very, very lovely gingival aesthetics around your implant, especially in the anterior region. Okay, so for those of you who are chasing the ideal implant aesthetics, I'd like to advise you to consider the use of a, a ceramic implant. For those of you who wish to see a ceramic implant procedure being done, please kindly contact Sneha. We might be able to do some mentoring for you as well. And with that, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, Dr. Kumar, there's actually three questions asked, uh, one in the chat and two in the Q&A. Uh, let me share with you the one in the chat. Uh, mm -hmm. Does ceramic implants break more easily than titanium implant? So we have already mentioned this before. In the past, it was very obviously a problem because ceramic implants, the manufacturing process had not been completely understood and perfected. And I also told you that the surface was blasted by uh, um, sand particles, aluminum oxide particles. We don't do that anymore. We actually now use, um, we etch the surface of the zirconia to prevent it to be from too brittle. Now, is a ceramic implant more brittle than a titanium implant? The answer is yes, but they're about the same in terms of um, the amount of fractures you would see uh, over a period of um, five years, 10 years. Lots of studies around to tell us whether the, the longevity studies of an implant lasting five or 10 years, both for ceramic and titanium. My opinion is at this point of time, it is safe enough, safe enough for us to use confidently in our patients and certainly my patients. I've been using it for the last, uh, since 2017, as I've said, I have not had uh, any implant breakages. Here, the question uh, in the Q&A, yeah. any real osteo integration of ceramic implants like uh, titanium implants? Okay, I will answer this question. For those of you who actually think titanium implants completely also integrate, you have to be, uh, you, you'll be very surprised. Unfortunately, the truth is that it, you don't get 100% also integration around a titanium implant. You don't. And there are many reasons for this, okay? Firstly, there are lots of uh, impurities on the implant surface of a titanium implant or a ceramic implant for the matter. If you take a look at any form of OPGs or peripicals or CT scans, you will always find some small little gap between your implant and the bone. And you're wondering, what did you do wrong? How come it doesn't integrate? And the reason for that is because of all these small impurities. And because of that, you have a general uh, concern whenever you do an x-ray, you say, I'm not sure the implant has healed. This has happened, not just for me, it happened to many implant surgeons, okay? Now, in the instance of zirconia, zirconia forms an oxide layer between the bone and the zirconia surface. And if you, this oxide layer prevents ingress of bacteria to the point where if bacteria cannot go down the implant threads, you don't get this problem with perimplantitis. Well, you do get perimplantitis for any... The moment you place an implant in the mouth, you have to understand it will start to fail. That's number one, okay? However good the control of oral hygiene is, it will start to fail. You have to accept this. However, with good oral hygiene and good cleaning aids and good practices, you'd obviously get uh, good habits for the patient to keep the implant longer in the mouth. But here is an implant system which has the ability to have a good gingival cuff and good long junctional epithelium forming around it and with a corrosion layer preventing bacteria from going right down to the depths of it. Okay, Dr. Jetty has asked a question for anterior cases, the best position to sink the ceramic implant for best prosthetic emergence profile. Okay, for best prosthetic emergence profile, okay, for the emergence profile uh, is obviously better to um, sink the implant subcrestal. But the good news for all of us is that the Zeramex has angulated abutments. It does not have an angulated abutment screw, but it has angulated abutments. If you want the best emergence profile for your ceramic implant, 
for the purposes of uh, a titanium implant, you would place the implants up gingerly and you would like a lot of thick gingival tissue buckle to your implant. Now for the case in a ceramic implant such as Zeramax, the implant is actually placed supracrestal. You place the Zeramax implant up to 0.6 millimeters supracrestally, especially in the anterior region. And purely because the implant abutment, the neck of the implant fixture, apologies, the neck of the implant fixture is smooth. It actually sticks very well to gingiva. So for me, in my practice, for a titanium implant, anteriorly, I would place it subcrestally. For a Zeramex XT implant, I would place the implant slightly supragingibly. Uh, sorry, apologies. I would place it supracrestally up to 0 0.6 millimeters. Of course, you can't be precise in that, but it's just above the level of the crestal bone. So Dr. Faisal's question, are the Zeramex implants bone level or tissue level implants? They can be both. Uh, most of the advantages seem to be good long junction epithelium in addition to the ceramic. Can we get similar results with a bone level titanium implant with a zirconia? Yes, you can, but you have to communicate to your laboratory. If a zirconia abutment is polished and... Um, so here you are, you have a lovely zirconia crown, okay? It's super polished, of course, but the tissue surface is also highly polished. You are not gonna get uh, much long junction epithelium over there. You have to instruct your lab to, to treat the surface. Don't over treat the surface, don't polish it. They can sandblast the area to make it rough. Yes, and that should improve the, the some form of uh, long jun junctional epithelium forming between the tissue surface of a zirconia abutment and to the surrounding gingiva. But in terms of asking me whether it's gonna be similar results to a bone level titanium implant, once again, as I said to you before, a bone level titanium implant never ever truly gets 100% uh, implant and bone fusion. It never does that. If you don't believe me, take a look at all your x-rays. Take a look with PAs, peripicals. You will never get full bone contact to your implant, okay? However, with if you look at um, uh, zirconia implants, and I'm not saying that all of the zirconia implants will have exactly the same result, but plenty of them, you'd see far much better bone apposition to the implant surface for that of a zirconia implant. I hope that was useful. Uh, Dr. Kumar, one question uh, uh, in, the, in the chat. Uh, how about uh, biocompatibility of ceramic implants? Um, I'm not sure what exactly that means, but a ceramic implant that is placed in the mouth, such as Zeramax, is biocompatible to both uh, bone and uh, gingiva, so there isn't any problem in terms of um, versus titanium, which is more biocompatible in terms of also integration with the bone, but we would have obviously have a problem with the gingiva. So it's far much more biocompatible uh, compared to a titanium implant in the mouth, purely just because, as as many people will say, gingiva loves zirconia, zirconia loves gingiva. So I hope that answers your question about the biocompatibility of uh, ceramic implants. Uh, Dr. Kumar, no more questions? Okay, I've said this a few times again. It's for up to all of us to look at new products in the market. And of course, if there's lots of good research that supports the use of them, certainly it's best to find someone who has done a lot of this before. In Singapore, I would say that probably I've done the most in Singapore and very happy to take you through procedures which I have done in the past or even show you how the kit works or surgically there's some tips and tricks which can be used. Um, I have had multiple uh, issues with regards to the uh, uh, armamentarium. There is both surgically and prosthetically, prosthetically okay? So for those who've had uh, problems with fractured abutment screws, uh, fractured um, um, implants, um, fractured carriers for implants in a titanium world, well, I've experienced all of this in the ceramic world. So if there are any form of... Uh, uh, questions or perhaps any surgical tips I can share with you. We can certainly meet up in person again and then talk to you this and tell you how I've overcome this and what tips and tricks I can uh, give you so that this will not happen in your hands. Because having uh, a, a Zeramax bicarbo screw 
stuck inside and a button that you want to remove is very, very, very annoying. And I've got some tips and tricks to share for those of you who'd be interested, but it's something which, as I said, is not uh, simple compared to a titanium implant. Titanium implant, uh, a new graduate can place a titanium implant, but I would certainly not advise anyone who's brand new to implants to start with, with the zirconia implants. Completely different level um, ball game altogether. And, and there's a small learning curve which you will need to overcome. But once you start, it's a very, very lovely world of biological dentistry ahead of you. With that, thank you very much, everyone. Good night.